Saint Jean Baptiste. So people can see and hear us on the stream. If anybody's there, who knows? I'll just make camera so <laughs> I don't look like I'm. Oh, we do have a few people I, with I us in the chat. Hi, people in the chat. It's good to oh, see my. you. Hi, chat. All right. Well, so we have picked our next book. Tracy's managed to get into the script. She hasn't had time to read through it and fix all of my typos and weirdness that sometimes gets in because I write scripts like in the 20 minutes before we record. See that she's fixing it right now. <laughs> so, all right. Well, then. And then is this the end of the month? We're getting close, aren't we? Well, I guess technically next week is the true end of the month. Yeah. Well, next week's mm. going to be the first. Of we July. should talk to Sam and see if we can't squeeze in a, a fit episode on maybe on Tuesday. Sweet. Uh, Would you be up for that? Let me double check Tuesday. Okay. But yeah. Because um, I was trying to figure out, like, at some point we talked about if we're going to go every other month for for the fit episodes, it'd be nice to have them on the opposite months from the book club but in order to do that we have to do either two in a row for fit or end up having like a three month gap um right. so and i've finally managed to get back yeah, to the gym for the first time in a year and a half so i, I have stuff to talk about <laughs> i did a workout today too the tuesday the big thing is that's fred's workout day ah. so it maybe if we do like eight fifteen, oh yeah um it'll be a little easier to fit it yeah. in i can't imagine eight fifteen would be a problem my wife keeps encouraging me. There's a, a voice actress who does a podcast that she listens to, uh, who does a bunch of geeky um, voice characters and whatever. Um, she keeps encouraging me to reach out to her and see if she, if she would come on an episode someday of the Fit stuff. So, oh, nice. She may be too big time for us though. But you don't know unless you ask. Yep, yeah, ask him. You see. <laughs> All so. right. So, shall we get started here? Yeah. Let me get my cursor over to my second screen so I can hit record on the audio, which I am doing now. Hi, Sam. This no. Hey, Sam. Not Sam. Aaron. I think Aaron edits the the book club these days. Hi, Aaron. Hi, Aaron. <laughs> Hey, Aaron. <laughs> Hi. All right. Um, and I'm pretty sure I've got the audio set up so we're not echoing and everybody can hear everybody. So yeah. folks in the chat, if you can't hear everybody, please uh, shout at us and let me know. But otherwise, I think we're ready. Shall we? Let's, sure. let's talk about books. Yay. This episode of the Tome Show is brought to you by Galder's Gazetteer, Advanced Rules for Your Game, and Also Fights Cancer, and by our patrons. You can join them over at patreon.com slash the Tome Show. Welcome to the Tome Book Club of June 2021. The Tome is a D&D news, reviews, and interview show, and I'm your Tome host, Tracy Hurley. And I'm Jeff Greiner. In each book club episode, we discuss one D&D-related book, spoilers be damned, in full, bu full book club style. And our book this time around is Dragons of Spring Dawning by Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman. And with us, as always, is Eric Paquette. Bonjour. Hello. Bonjour. Bonne saint Jean. <laughs> yes. uh, so the next episode, which we're going to record near the end of August, we'll be talking about Children of Virtue and Vengeance by Tomi Adeyami. Which is the second book in the what was the name of the series orisha was that the something like that but yeah, i don't remember this series but was well, so it the first one the children blood and bone, blood and bone. Yeah. Yep. Is... nope yeah <laughs> the audiobook entry that i have is not going to tell me right away what it is but the, uh, the, but there we are uh, that's fine 
Uh, before we get into that, though, I want to say thank you to our sponsor, Galder's Gazetteer. Uh, that it's a product that takes your game to a new level with advanced rules for all kinds of stuff and the support to help make it happen. Uh, and it also raises money as you when you buy that book. The proceeds go to uh, re- cancer research because because we're going to cure cancer through gaming. Uh, look for links to information about the the story of how Galder's Gazetteer came to be and um, where to find the book uh, in the show notes at thetomeshow.com. All right, now on to the book. We read Dragons of Spring Dawning. It is book three in the Dragonlance Chronicles series uh, or trilogy, which is, as I recall, I'm trying to remember this history off the top of my head. I didn't like look up the wikipedia page ahead of time like i sometimes do uh but the dragonlance chronicles series as i recall um weiss and hickman basically ran the the game and wrote the books and wrote the adventure modules more or less at the same time uh, and that they were some of the first D novels and adventures does anybody remember uh, if I'm horribly wrong about some of this? From what I'm gathered, though, at least the legend of those books, that's mm-hmm. how it is. And I, and I think I read that, yes, that is yeah. correct, where uh, the books... Was, I, I've read The Adventures. Okay. Uh, I've never run, never played or read it, but uh, I have read them, read the books. Okay. So. Are, they, are the Adventures, the, are the adventures uh, decent? The yeah, adventures are mm-hmm. decent. They follow a sort of a sort of troop style play okay. because, like in the books, you have separation of the yes. characters at different places. So they have here's a module following these characters. Here's a module following okay. these characters. So if you're playing, if you're playing Tassahoff and you're not in a scenario for the Tassahoff, you either don't show up or you play a different character because they add other characters in the adventure for those. Who, also, you do get a a mix of different characters, yeah. and you could possibly have a different G- DM take over of some mm. certain. Uh, See, I, I plus they have. I admit to being a little bit distracted at times, thinking through that original sort of lore of where this all came from, and thinking to myself, "Wait a minute! If this character has like gone away, where did that player go? If this was a, a game they were playing, <laughs> like." <laughs> Because yeah. uh, one of the things, for example, yeah. one of the things that happens in, in this book is uh, Gold Moon and Riverwind um, sort of step out of the adventure. And I'm like, well, is that a couple of players who had to stop playing or moved away or, or whatever? Or, you know, what happened here? But if it's a troop style play, then then they, they needed to yeah. set the troop sizes to the right numbers for the players they had. And then that's how they can jump around a little bit. Yeah. yeah. There's even one scenario, which is it, you get to play the whole war in a war game format, and they indicate in that that you can have certain, if you have certain battles, how to put the adventure mm. influence that and how to mix himself and stuff like that. So it was it's a very ambitious. Yeah. Uh, so, so Dragons of Spring Dawning is the the third and final ish book of the Chronicles, and I say that I don't know. I originally, in my youth, said that with some hesitancy uh, because, to my th- middle school mind, the most important and most interesting character in the whole thing was Raislin, and Raislin's story is not encapsulated in these three books. It's encapsulated in the in this these three books and the three books that come afterwards. Um, and so if you're looking at his story, it is not a satisfying conclusion to things uh, in this. Uh, well, yes? You, you, mentioned in, you do mention about that story to Tasselhoff. Say it again? There's a lot at the end, at the end where oh, yeah. Man, Paladin mentioned the fact that yeah you, that you will have a story to yeah no the uh, Fisman absolutely um, I mean 
one could argue foreshadows, but in many ways just outright spoils uh, Tasselhoff on, on, yeah. on what the next set of books is going to be about, right? Um, yes. Uh, and so, yeah. Spoilers. I, there, there were some other moments earlier that sort of foreshadowed what the next series was going to be about. But Fisben's line there was like, oh, no, that's just what's going to happen in the next story. Um yeah, so but but that said, I had an extremely different experience reading this book this time around than I remembered having reading the book when I was young. Um, I think, and I, and I mentioned this to Tracy after a recording last week. I think it was um, my yeah, yeah my experience with this book originally was very different because I was in a very different mindset. Like by the time I got to this book. The only story I really cared about at all was Raceland's story. And I and I think I said to Tracy that really it was probably because I was tied up in this this um this you know power fantasy of Raceland, right? I saw you know Raceland is an outcast who was physically weaker but but believed himself to be mentally superior to all of everybody else. And honestly, that was 100% me at the age of like 12 or 13, right? I was an outcast, I was a geek, I was overweight. Uh, you know, so I was physically in, inferior, but I but I was convinced that I was smarter than everybody else, right? Uh, and so Raceland was absolutely I followed the Raceland story absolutely with the idea in mind of like, "Oh, oh, see, see some Someday I'm going to have the power. Someday I'm going to win, right? Uh, and so all of the rest of the story like completely disappeared for me in my youth. Uh, and, and, and it's unfortunate because like one of my impressions of, of the Dragonlance stories and even going back into it, I'm like, this Barum character is weird. It doesn't really get the development. It just sort of pops up out of nowhere and, and ends up kind of being a MacGuffin and not really that big of a deal and it's not one of our main characters or whatever. And now my second time going through it, the first two books, I kind of had that impression of him. And then by the third book, I realized, no, I was just wrong because I didn't read the book very thoroughly the first time I read it, right? Well, I yes, can see Baron, that. Go ahead, Tracy. I was just going to say, I could see that. Go yeah. ahead, Eric. Yeah, and the first two books, I also Baron was just mentioned... Right. Yeah. As people know, but in the this one, you actually you actually get to interact yeah. with him. Throughout the and whole I mean, story. and I he and I think there's a little bit of like my first impression from my youth of Barum is a li- feel still feels a little bit true because he is the character at, with which the entire fate of the universe sort of hinges, and and he just sort of pops up with little cameos for like two thirds of the story. <laughs> so uh, so it is a little bit like out of nowhere that like I, I don't know. I was of the mind that, like, the most important characters should be the ones we're telling the story about, not this sort of side character that kind of popped up every now and then. Um, so that much is still kind of true. But I didn't realize, I, I had forgotten how much the development there is. And I, and I feel like as we talk about it as a game uh, and how they ran it, I kind of feel like by book three here, there were moments where Barum became a PC, Possibly. To me, it, or you might have had a guest appearance right. by someone who joined the game. So, but yeah. So. so, so anyway, we haven't really talked about where this <laughs> book picks up. Um, this book, I felt like picked up more immediately after the second book, if I remember correctly, right? The, the, there was a, a sizable gap between book one and book two. Like there was, there were whole adventures that took place in between book one and book yeah. two that we only ever got like hints of that this thing exists, happened, and it's really important, but we're just going to tell you that it happened and it was important to move on, right? It's one of my complaints, I guess, about the series is that it has this tendency to be like, here's a really important thing that happened, but we don't really care about that thing that happened. We only care about the after effects of, of why it matters. Uh, and so they never really tell, told that story. Now, in fairness, that also gave them an opportunity to write a bunch of spinoff sort of side quest books that told, I think, some of those stories. Um, but this book, I feel I felt like did that less. Does that sound? I can. The only instance of that happening this time around, I think, was uh, Gilfinus um, discovering what was happening with the good dragon eggs. Yeah, because that that, that happened off camera, but yeah. it, but it kind of 
it was better explained. They kind of told the story in character, and it kind of worked better, I think. Because, yeah. Uh, yeah, we we pick up about five days after Tannis has been discovered, la- la- in the end of book two, two discovered by Kiara. Mm-hmm. Now, five days, he's left Kiara because she's gone. To battle. Yeah, that's that's where we left uh, off last time, right? Is that um, Tannis and and much of the crew, not all of them, but much of the party had ended up in the town of Floatsome. Um, Tannis was mistaken for a, a dragon officer in the the army of of Tachesis or Tachesis or how did the audiobook pronounce it? Tracy, do you remember? I feel like they, they okay. leaned heavily into the Isis, like it was talk Isis, um, which is a pronunciation I never heard growing up, but um, I've always preferred talk Isis. So, um, but yeah, so, so, oh yeah. And if, just real quick, if I recall correctly, I didn't read all of Dragonlance book two because that was like when the, was that when the pandemic hit? Oh, I don't hit? remember. <laughs> I had forgotten that you never uh, read all of book two. Yeah, so that's why it's a little hard for me. I think that's probably I went right into the deep end and was like, oh my god. Because you 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 missed the the death of Sturm. You missed um, you missed the the splitting of the party. Lorana becoming a main character. Um, I mean, she was kind of a main character in book one, but she really steps into her own by book three. Um, Yeah, so. And probably some of that Kitiara stuff. Some of, some of the development of Kitiara. Um, what? Yeah, that, that's that's one of the things where like Kitiara is a really big deal character as well. That I felt like had this exponential growth in terms of development. Like she was kind of mentioned in book one. She kind of we kind of learned a little bit more about it in book two, and then by book three, she's like a super major character, right? So she's a huge deal. I mean, she was kind of a huge deal before, uh, before, but you, you, but only because you were being told she was a huge deal more than being shown that she was a huge deal. Yeah. When I don't think I picked up in the earlier stuff, like that she was going like to basically be on the opposite side of everyone else. It could have just been I missed oh. it, but when I we started off this book with that like that, I was like, oh my god, where are we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah no. <laughs> In, in book one, they sort of <laughs> discuss that she, as I recall, they discuss that she went off on her own and she was off, you know, seeking her fortune as a mercenary or whatever. Um, and I don't remember if it's in book one that you learn that she's joined the dragon armies, but by book two... It's only, it's only in book two. That okay, you so in book two, you find right. out that not only she is, is she in the dragon armies, but she's like one of the generals, one of the high lords. Um <laughs> And that shows up in the big battle where they kill Star. What'd you say, Eric? Right. Did not tell the end of book two that you oh, okay. learned that she's. Oh, she looks. It's Kiara who just leading this dragon and t- army. And I'll tell and you what the the Kitiara's role almost exclusively focuses on her former relationship and her former and current relationship with Tannis. Like, that is the entire focus of her connection to the party. To the point that I sometimes forget, she's also Raceland and Karaman's sister. And that should be a really big deal, you know? Yeah. Well, that, was the be- that was the thing. It was like, it was like this family with Tannis along, and then, oh, well, now she's on the other right. side. And it's really hard because she's the only female character who owns her sexuality. Mm-hmm. And now she's on the bad side and it keeps getting brought up in terms of like her sharing her bed with various people and then the inner the the attempted exchange of prisoners quote unquote Mm -hmm. uh is all about that thing instead of her her power like her action like why is she a general is it just because of who she slept with Mm -hmm. like it's really unclear from the books of what (laughs) yeah what is going on there you see you see the development and growth of Lorana in a lot of ways, but it's a lot less about her sexuality. 
You know, you you watch Lorana sort of grow from a hangers on at the beginning of the the story in book one to to growing to being the the golden general. And at one point uh, at, at the end, we're just skipping all over the place in the story. But at one point at the end, just completely rejecting Tannis because she's like, "No, I don't need you to save me. I'm I'm the shit here. Like I'm going to take care of this. Thank you." <laughs> right, but but no real love life to speak of at all. And then, uh, is it Gold Moon is out of the story for this one because surprise, she's pregnant, (laughs) and so thus can't can't participate in anything important. Has to go. (laughs) So I'm sorry, I just child. I checked out of the book in some ways because I just Mm. people had told me that this was a really strong strong series for female characters, and I just don't see it. Oh, yeah, I don't know that I would have put this up as a really strong series for female characters. I think it has some strengths compared to its peers from the time that it was published, maybe. Um, right. But but it also has its flaws, right? There are, th- yeah, there are definitely think- characters that could have been portrayed as strong female characters that didn't have to be men for any part of the story, except that that was the standard in fantasy. That still is the standard in fantasy, right? Yep. And and it's like so. One of the jokes I always make about Wheel of Time has to do with like the pulling the braids all the time because that's what all the female characters. In this one, it's just um, also if I could go without hearing another, she gets a really good price on the slave markets. Oh right. Um, <laughs> conversation that was throughout the entire book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no. Absolutely. Just being honest. No, yeah, that's that, it's a thing. It's, it's in the book often. Well, and you, and you get it. Yeah. I'm trying to think ahead because again, it's been decades since I've read the since I read these books the first time. But I'm thinking about the the second trilogy, the Legends trilogy, that really follows the story of Raceland um, as well. And I, I, as I recall, Tika shows up there as well. Um, yes, but it also has very problematic issues with depictions of rape, uh, where where Raceland falls in love with a woman and then rapes her, uh, as I recall. But it's again, it's been decades, so I might be remembering slightly off. But yeah, yeah. so so yeah, no, there's Consider- there's things. Yeah, considering Raceland goes from being a neutral person to becoming a evil black. Mm-hmm. Uh, mage Just having the series have rape and have, have, have rape in it right if, if, it's going to be a surprise to me but it's been also years decades since I've read that right. series so, so yeah no okay. it's not it's not as strong of a of a depiction of strong women as it could have been um, it's it's yeah. better than some other D and D novels we've read. If if you want you want to damn it with faint praise, right? <laughs> uh, the other the other characters that we have female characters we have Tika mm-hmm. who's rather meek and just learning and she's young. To me, she feels very young looking for her looking relationship for with Caramon. Uh, and then there is. Uh, the uh, the silver dragon, Silvara, Silvara, yes, which we barely see. Right, <laughs> and that's one of the ones where where I feel like I don't know. I know they did a bunch of like side quest or or spin off books and whatever that explained some of the things they skipped. Um, uh-huh. And I, th- I'm guessing there's more with Silvara, uh, but I've never read any of those, so I don't actually know. That's not the CL for whatever I forget. No, that's not the CL. Th- yeah. That's, uh, the, that was, that's the other. Yeah. That's when they come back with information from about the eggs uh, with uh, Lorena's sister. There is there is Slavara, who in book two we had, had been revealed that she is a silver dragon. silver dragon, sister right. to the dragon that Huma uh, right. wrote. Who, who yeah. has this similar sort of... Uh, you know, in love with with um, Gilthanus, who also loves her but cannot acknowledge it because 
he's an elf and they're proud and they can't be with non-elves, The similar, which is similar to the love that Lorana had for Tannis back in the day. So, yeah, so anyway, uh, Floatsome, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, Tannis uh, escapes uh, Kitiara's bedchamber, so to speak, um, gets back with the party and is like, Stuff's going down. We got to get out of here, even though there's a massive raging storm going on. Uh, they find a ship that is willing to take them. That also happens to have as its helmsman Barum the Everman, who we've met in those two cameos in the previous books, right? Um, which ultimately, long story short, they they are pursued um, into the Blood Sea of Istar, where there is a giant red whirlpool in the middle of the ocean, and they end up sailing into it as Kitiara, uh, on her blue dragon sky, comes after them. Um, this is also the moment when Raceland completely abandons them and goes off on a solo adventure for the rest of the story. Um, which, which, yeah, which became interesting, because that that's also when we learn some of the backstory of his um, testing at the High Tower at Weyrith, <laughs> Uh, where, you know, Tannis is like, you're, there's no way you're going to abandon your brother to die, and Rayson's like, well, actually, uh, I, I've kind of killed him before. Yes. Uh, let me tell you about the test, wherein I killed my twin brother, who who is, like, the only person I care about in this world. So I am I know for a fact I am perfectly capable of, of this. And basically just teleports and, and leaves the fight, and um, we don't see much of him. Well, we don't see him with the party again until, like, the very end. And even then, he's not really with the party. Like, at that point, I feel like Raceland just became an NPC. <laughs> so, nobody's yeah. playing Raceland anymore. Which, for your story about maybe, well, maybe that, that's the point where the player who was playing Raceland now took over and started playing Barrett. Oh, yeah, I see no, uh, to, to not not to skip ahead, but I felt like Barum was acting as an NPC for most of the story. Barum was telling his backstory; he was giving lots of exposition, but he wasn't really doing anything um, until they were prisoners in the temple at the end. And then all of a sudden, Barum is like crushing draconian skulls against the wall and he's fighting back and he's t taking a lot more agency uh and so my thought was um you know spoiler for later in the book my f thought was that when flint died that's when the player of flint switched over and started playing Barry. <laughs> that that also is yeah. fair too so. so so yeah so they end up in, in the blood sea of istar they were rescued. Some of the, well, the party was rescued by sea elves. Apparently, everybody else on the ship died, so the DM didn't have to deal with all those NPCs. Um, I, I empathize with that DM who kills off NPCs just because they don't want to have to play a whole stable of characters. Um, and they meet a red wizard who's been living in the bottom of the the Blood Sea, uh, wherein there are the ruins of. The, the old city of Istar that was destroyed in the cataclysm when the gods um, became angered with humanity and, and withdrew and threw a mountain at the, the world. Uh, and so this guy's down there living uh, because uh, the woman he loves, who is a sea elf, lives down there. Um, am I correct in yeah. the implication also that in... On Kryn, which is the world of Dragonlance, on Kryn, all dolphins are sea elves? That is what they seem to imply. I mean, they definitely said that sea elves turn into dolphins. My implication was that all the dolphins were sea elves, and that's, I guess, why they seem so smart. There's a small one. <laughs> okay. I, they don't say those, and I don't know right. the way if, if, if it is all or if it's most. Or if it's a portion. Right. But. Okay. So so I enjoyed the, the visiting of Istar. I enjoyed the, the meeting of the Red Wizard down there. Uh, I don't remember that Red Wizard being a thing in any other stories. But I kind of hope he is. Or, or, you know, that we discover him later. Because 
he seems like an interesting juxtaposition to the only other Red Wizard we've met at this point, which is Raislin. Um, but then I think it's fair to switch over to the other group, which is Lorana, Flint, and Taz. Uh, and they are in the, um, what's the, oh, I forget the name of the city. Does anybody else remember that? It's the, like, the, the uh, headquarter, the capital of the, of the... Yeah, is it Palantis? Uh, Palantis? Palantis? Palantis, yeah. Palantis? Yeah, I forget the name of the, the kingdom, but but they're there. Um, and and Lorana ends up, like, after the events of the last book, all of the leaders of the Knights of Salamnia um, have been killed. And they decide, well, the most... The most uh, worthy sort of person we have left to lead this army is uh, a, somebody who's not even a knight and has never been a knight. Uh, so let's have Lorana take over as the new general, the new leader of the Knights of Salamia. There's this whole debate about like, but can she do that? We've never had a woman be the leader. And somebody else is like, uh, yeah, we have. There have been women leaders. You just don't. It hasn't happened in your lifetime. Uh, in, yes, because we were introduced by uh, yeah, Astinus, Astinus. Yeah, who's actually one of my favorite characters that I, I had forgotten about from the series. Um, I kind of want to steal Astinus and, and put an Astinus, or maybe put Astinus himself literally on every world that I ever played D&D &D in. Somewhere there's a librarian writing down the stories of everything that happens in the world. Um, who's immortal. Is, is he writing about the world or about the multiverse? Well, Maybe there's just different Astinuses, but they're all Astinus, right? And that, is that where we get like a connection between what still happened to Raceland and everyone else, or did I make that up? In... No. Well, was before we get to Lorana in the book, we actually see what happened to Raceland, where he wound up at the library, at the steps yeah. of the library of, of Palantus, which apparently nobody but the aesthetics are supposed to go in, but Astinus recognizes who it is. And ask him to bring him in. And he wants to do some research about what's happening to him and all that. And well, because presumably Astinus and, does that because Astinus knows what's going on with Raislin, right? He's aware. Yes. Uh, like, you can imagine that, that for our perspective, it's like, hey, in book two, there's this weird voice talking in Raislin's head. And we find out it's been happening to him ever since his testing at, at the tower, High Tower of Weyrith. Um, but... but I can totally imagine in Astinus's notes, it's like, and that's when Fist and Dandalus started speaking to Race. Like he knows exactly who it is, uh, and you know, and and yeah. Fist and Dandalus's books are there in the library. Um, well, also based on what Fist and said oh the yeah, end, <laughs> about the time travel, right? Because <laughs> at the end of the book, spoilers, <laughs> Fist Band mentions the task that. Raceland, yeah. Karaman, and K Tassahoff, and some others will go on a time traveling adventure. Since Asinus records all time, yes, he's, he's, he's already he's written about Raceland in the yes, past. Yeah, I, I've, ah. I didn't even think about that. That's true. So he he knows exactly how important Raceland is, and he has to like assuming he and and we are prescribing to the the version of time travel where you can't change anything. Um, you know, yeah. Asinus has to let him in because he already did let him in in order for Raceland to go on the journey that would send him to the past. Um, so there's no choice yeah. there. He still has to be dramatic. Right? So, say, I'll, I'll, I'll see him if he lives. Right. Right. I mean, you have to have the draft. Yeah. There. And I like how Aston is, like, he's not a jerk, but he's, you know, and he's not a bad person. But he's all, you can also tell, like, He's seen it all, and he just doesn't care sometimes. Like, I, I don't care about your finery. I don't care about your diplomacy. I don't care about the, you know, uh, uh, sugarcoating things, you know, because he's seen so much, and he, and he knows so much. He's been around for so long. He's just like, let's, let's get to the point. Let's move on to the, to the part where we, where we get something done. I've been watching a lot of Star Trek lately, and Astinus felt a lot like a Vulcan. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Uh, just passionate, just logical. <laughs> here, here is a fact. 
There well, because he's kind of over it, and he knows that there's no consequences for him. He's just there yeah. to record it. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah so right. that's where Raceland's at. So, Raceland yes, right. is, is dying um, in, the, in the library um, and slowly nursing, being nursed back to health and um, allowed to, th- when he becomes strong enough, go into the stacks and, and study the books that... Um, that that lay the groundwork basically for the next story, right? It's it's um, he needs to get in. What is it? He needs to get into the tower of high sorcery in Palanthus that nobody can get into, and he can't get in. Nobody can get in because you need the key, and the key has been missing for you know wh- however long. It, it it was lost to time way back when. Yeah. Well, the prophecy is the master of the past and present right. can go in. Right. Um, which, of course, is, is the first bit of foreshadowing of, well, if the key disappeared in the past and he's the master of past and present, now we know why the key disappeared as well, right? <laughs> it disappeared from the past because that's where he went to go get it. <laughs> so, yeah. So, I don't want to do spoilers for the next book, but I need to know this. Is Raceland maybe not dying in the next three books? Because he's always almost dying. <laughs> um... Well, in from what from what I recall, in the next series of books, he is not dying, and there is still the relationship, and most, it's mostly deals with Caramon trying to get over that get over of not being with Raceland and Raceland not needing anymore. He's strong. Right. He's good. He's in good health. And right. Car- Caramon cannot accept. Well, that. and that kind of that kind of started at, by the end of this book, all right? Like like Raceland shows up at the end yes. of this book, and he's like, he's "I don't need that. you anymore, Caramon." But Caramon's been literally taking care of this guy his entire life, uh, and and Raceland is still right. like physically frail, but he's not coughing and hacking and almost dying all the time, right? So no, uh, I think as of the end of of this book, Raceland is not in a position of al- almost dying all the time. He, he maybe almost dies a few times, but he's not almost dying all the time. Well, because you're like, he's all, like, now he's almost dying. And I was like, how is that different? <laughs> how different? And it's because, like, it was really super bad, but, like, really? Right. I think he just didn't want to go underwater. <laughs> Raceland can't, Raceland yeah. can't swim, that's the issue. Yeah. So. Well, and this is also, this is the book where we also find out that Raceland is no longer just Raceland. Raceland is both Raceland and this ancient evil wizard Fist and Dandalus at the same time. Yeah. I think Fist and Dandalus is his past self, and it, 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 it's a big oh, tiny, is it? I'll, time travel shenanigans. Now I, I do got to read the, the Legend series again, because my, my recollection wasn't that it, that it was his past self, but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I've cer- I've certainly pulled that trick before with uh, in a D and D campaign. I had a warlock character whose patron ended up being himself, having gone back to the past and and lived survived for several centuries to become his own patron. And this is a section of the book. If so, this is where I started to get lost mm-hmm. um, reading the book or the main place where I was lost because it did feel like maybe the chapters weren't linear in time. To also play on what kind of what's going on is that kind of correct? I didn't get that impression. I got the same impression. That you did that. That there it, it, it were there were some there were some stuff that were a bit taken longer than mm-hmm. others, and they were just trying to sink it back so at the end they can be all at the same time. But yes, and, and there were some things like revelations from the past that if you weren't listening or reading really closely. Like, because I listen to it, right? So it's like, if I miss that we suddenly had a transition and we're now talking about back when the eggs, dragon eggs were first collected Mm -hmm. or something like that, like, it could be easy. Well, and there's a lot of... You were not in present They spend a lot of time... um, There's a lot of sort of exposition and flashbacks. You know, we get we we flash back to the story right, of yeah. Baron. We flash back to the story of the eggs first being taken. We flash back to the story of the eggs, turns out, being used in this ritual that's creating the Draconians. We flash back to the story of what happened to the tower, um, and and to the story of Lord Soth, and to the story of is like we fl- do a lot of flashing back. It's a little bit like um, 
it's a little Tolkien-esque, right? Tolkien really loved having people give long speeches about the history of the world. Um, in, in Tolkien's case, in some ways that aren't necessarily super pertinent to the actual story that's going on. But, uh, um, but yeah, so there's a lot of that happening, I think, in this story. And honestly, I remember, you know, in speaking of things being different than how I remember them, my recollection was that Lord Soth was a lot cooler uh, when I read it in my youth than he ended up being here. Like, Lord Soth um, is is basically the manservant to Kitiara uh, through much of the story, uh, you know. And that's that's really his... He doesn't even gain his own sort of agency uh, until almost the very end. And even then, he's still serving Kitiara and everything she says. Um, so that's an, an interesting bit that... Like, I remember him being a lot more badass um, than he ends up being, so. I wonder, I wonder if he shows up in Dragonlance Legends, and maybe that's where you're thinking Maybe. Of. Well, and, and I know he also, I mean, he goes so far as to, to getting his own domain in, in the Mists of Ravenloft. And, Ravenloft, which I you know, book. So. so, yeah. So there's a whole, like, people really like Lord Soth, and he does a lot of stuff, but I remembered that happening here, and it... He didn't do that stuff and wasn't really that badass here. Um, so, so yeah. So in, oh, yeah. anyway, we get the, the story uh, that that's Raceland's story. Then we we get the story of Lorana, Tass, and Flint, who are working with the 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 good armies and the good dragons. The silver dragons specifically showed up to help, um, largely because Gilthanus went and figured out that you know. The evil dragons aren't really holding your eggs hostage. They're killing them. They're killing your babies. So you better come and, and do something. But even then, it was mostly what silver and bronze or brass dragons that showed up. Like my thought was like, uh, and uh, is that the gold dragons are a bunch of jackasses, <laughs> right? Like they're killing your babies too. Where are we you? See, we see one, right? Yeah, we see one. Right. We see one. And they're the most powerful. They should be jumping in on this thing. <laughs> <clears throat> so anyway, so yeah, so Lorana becomes the golden general, the leader of the Knights of Salamnia. Uh, Flint becomes a dra- becomes a dragon rider, but only for one battle, um, and then insists that he's never riding dragons again. That was horrible. Um, well, there was also implications at that point in time that he was starting. Yes, to have heart there were problems. there were implications that he was starting to have heart problems. Because um, he's old, he was always the sort of old man of the group, um, even in if for a dwarf. Uh, and so, yeah, so Lorana turns out to be a really accomplished general. Like under her leadership, they start pushing back the dragon armies. They start winning this war. Um, and then we run into a hiccup. What was it? Kitiara sends a message. To Lorana, basically saying, uh, "I've got ta- I've got Tannis, and I'm willing to make an exchange for Tannis. You have one of my my generals or my leaders or whatever, uh, and I will make an exchange. You, I'll give you Tannis. You give me was it Baracus or whatever the the general's name was, Bacaris. Yeah. And and I like the fact how they did it in the writing because they did the writing beforehand after the ship had gone down. Mm. So we hadn't seen Tannis since then. We hadn't seen the underwater stuff, which we talked about right. here. But so, so did it? We don't know. Well, as a reader, but until... and, it, and it's also like it's a, it's clearly Kitiara lying, but it's a it's a lie yeah. that works because she is also pretty sure that they haven't seen Tannis because she watched the ship go down that he was on. Right. So clearly, Tannis is dead. Uh, so I can tell this lie, and nobody's going to contradict me on it because the guy that I'm saying is dead was lost at sea. Um, so yeah, and so so Lauren is like, well, I can't let all that happen. I'm going to go. Um, I'm going to go and 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 get Tannis back, right? Uh, and so Lorana goes and gets. What's that? Yes. Do the prisoner yes. exchange. Do the prisoner exchange. Uh, so and so, of course, Lorana is is captured. Now Lorana is a prisoner of um, the dragon armies, uh, and that's about when um, Tannis and crew 
appear nearby Palanthus and end up going back to the city, right? So, so. Well, it was Kelvin, and which probably is. Yeah, I don't remember the again. This the names of everything. I didn't. I don't. I listened to the audiobook, so I don't have like the maps like I used to pour over when I was a kid. Um, but the, but the 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 long story short is, that, and honestly, it wasn't that long of a story. Um, they get back to land, and they're not very far away from Palanthus, and so they go back to the city, uh, and they arrive shortly after Lorana has gone and been captured. And so they set up their plan. We got to go get Lorana, and and the party, minus Lorana, minus Gilfinus, minus. Um, Gold Moon, Gold Moon and Riverwind, who stay behind because she's pregnant and thus cannot do important things. In fairness, it's not presented that way. It's presented as we have to protect her baby. That's more important. <laughs> uh, but yes, um, and minus Raceland because he's back in reading books. Stop you. He's slowly turning evil uh, as he reads more of Fist and Daedalus's books. Right. Um. But everybody else, because it's a large, as you said at the beginning, it's a large troop-style game. Uh, everybody else gathers up and decides that they're going to ride the dragons, and they're going to go and save Lorana. And on the way there, their dragons are attacked by Pyrite, the the ancient to the point of like half-blind, half-senile gold dragon who attacks them. Um uh, on the spurring of, of Fizban, right? Um, which is another one of those moments, like, Fizban shows up and does a thing that ends up being... ends up looking like something minor or something wrong, and it ends up being, like, a really big deal and really important, right? There's the, there's this <laughs> moment later on, like, when they're like... Because you know, they're all pissed. Like, Fizban, you're such a, a an idiot, like... How did? How dare you attack us? You ruined the whole plan. Our dragons flew away. Um, everything is ruined. And then later on, they're like, "Wait a minute! If we had flown to Naraka on these dragons, we would have been dead before we hit the ground." <laughs> so it turned out it was a good thing we didn't go the way we did. It's almost like Fizbin knew what was going on and set it up that way. Um, Fizbin's story is one of the other stories that I remembered pretty well uh, from my youth. The idea that that he's not, you know, because, you know, spoilers be damned, right? Uh, Fizbin is Pal- the god Paladine, but he's not the super meddling god who who sort of leads armies and commands his generals. He he pops up to the at the beginning of the story and he asks somebody he asks Riverwind to sing or, or Goldmoon to sing a song, and that's where the entire adventure begins, right? He sort of puts them on the path. <laughs> Uh, he shows up here, and he, he he is responsible for them no longer flying by Dragonback. Uh, and that ends up saving their lives. It also puts them on the path to go to Godhome uh, and learn a little bit more about what's going on and learn more of Barum's story. Um, and, and that ultimately is going to, to lead to ultimate success, right? He, he takes a real light touch of, of yeah. I'm just going to sort of poke and prod and get people back on the path when they need to be on the path. Yeah. Yeah. In the adventure series, Fizban does show up, and he is described as an NPC character. He's never a PC. He's only a PC. He's described to the DM as a character that nudges people in the mm. direction that you need to go for those, by doing some crazy, silly right. stuff. Which you see in the book. That's, that's him. It was, it was. For Godzom, when he leads Godzom, I think he led him there, too, because he was expecting, feeling... The fact that Flint is about to die and he needs a place oh. for Flint to go, that's my impression. Yeah, he that sort of he sort of leads sense. them to a, this place because it's a, what, some sort of place of safety. This this ancient ruins called God Home that you know has this story, has this name because it was by legend it was the, the place where the gods lived or came into the world or whatever, and it was incredibly hard to find. And of course then how does Fizbin know how to find it? Like, you've had the hints for a long time that uh, of, of who Fizbin is, uh, but but it's becoming more and more um, clear what's going on with Fizbin. Um, and so they get to God home, but somehow they got turned around, they got lost, and Barum and um, on, um, Flint 
actually find the path to God home first. And for some reason, Flint doesn't say anything. He just see, notices that Barum has left and follows him. Um, and doesn't like shout back and say, hey, Barum, what's that? I thought that Baron like ran, yeah. and then, uh, and then Flint had a burst of speed, sort of surprising burst of speed, and and caught and caught. And sure, but why he did? But why and he then, didn't shout over his shoulder as he was running after him? Hey guys, Baron's running away. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, know. Other than it made it yeah. possible for for Flint to basically go and die of a heart attack, and by the time the rest of the party shows up, they see. Uh, Flint there dying at Barum's feet, and Tannis goes nuts and, and assumes that Barum has killed Flint and and stabs him with his sword, runs him through. Uh, but of course, Barum dies and then undies because he can. He's the Everman; he doesn't die. Although Raceland indicates that he can die. Um, so so Flint dies, goes off to the to the astral plane to live with the gods. Um, and there's a sad touch. There's you know sad touching moments with that. Then it's back on to the temple uh, of Naraka, the place that Barum has this whole time not wanted to go to. Um, place where he was born. Yes. Well, in many yeah, he was he was born in a farming village or whatever near Naraka. Uh, it was in Naraka that he first became what he is. Right. They found he and his sister Josla. <laughs> found an old ruins, uh, including these columns that had gemstones in it, and he pulled a gemstone out, and his, sis- and his sister tried to stop him, and she, he, like, pushed her away or whatever, and she fell and hit her head and died, uh, and then there was a flash of light or whatever, and suddenly the gemstone is embedded in his chest. And her soul is trapped there in the, the column. Um, which is weird. The... The whole Barum story it comes off a little inconsistent to me uh, because the the gemstone being removed from the column is kind of what locks the door and doesn't allow Takasis to come back to the world, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, and so that's why he's so important. That's why the dragon armies are looking for him because Takasis wants him back to, to open the door so that she can come back into the world. Okay, fine. But then the thing that finally banishes Takasis from the world is when he goes back and dies there at the column with the gem, <laughs> which seems like is exactly what she wanted and thus should have then opened the door and allowed her into the world. So I'm not entirely sure how that all makes sense. But does it make sense to anybody else? Well, I figured that for if she got control of him and there was a probably maybe a specific ritual to open up the door for her to come out. But the way that he died instead closed the mm. door permanently. Or, or close that door permanently. <laughs> Maybe. It was all that... For all the exposition and all the, the backstory and all the explanation they gave for all of these things, um, that was unclear and weird to me. <laughs> that the thing that she wanted... That Takasis wanted was the thing that happened and yet had the opposite result. Um, so I'm sure people will listen to this episode and, and tweet or email me with all kinds of reasons why I'm wrong. And it was thoroughly explained that I must not have been listening carefully enough. But here we are. Tracy, you've been awfully quiet. It happens. Yeah, what'd you say? I said it happens. <laughs> we sometimes listen wrong or read wrong. Or, or finish the book two, two weeks ago and, and forget chunks of it. <laughs> I timed it. I... Well, and I do remember... Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I timed it just right and managed to finish it literally this morning while I was eating breakfast. Right. Yeah, because I also remember, though, there was more to, like, the whole sister thing because at first it was he wanted to grab the gem because they were really yeah. poor and they didn't have a lot to eat. But I thought they went to some, like, weird place with, like, being able to help her find a husband or something at some point of it. Like... It, it got weird how he felt about his sister. 
Yeah, you wrong. might you might be right. You might be right. I remember I was confused about the whole what happened to Barum thing and how did dying do the thing. So I actually looked up um, on the Dragonlance wiki, like some of the story of Barum, and and one of the things they mentioned on the wiki is that there is some inconsistency with Barum's and Jasla's story as well. Um, you know, and and that in some stories they are depicted as being twins. Uh, just like Caraman and Raceland, but in other stories, they are depicted as him being uh, older than her, uh, and and there's all kinds of inconsistencies, sort of in in his story, I guess. Uh, or or there are some there are some inconsistencies in that story. So, but yeah, I I I don't specifically recall that part of the story, but I I believe you. That definitely seems like something that seems vaguely familiar in the back of my head. Yeah. Well, Barum's story feels a lot mythological in nature, and mythology has always inconsistencies among themselves. That's true. Children of stuff. The fact that Baron's story is inconsistent is like okay, well, that's how it is. <laughs> so. So we skipped ahead to, to Barum dying, but meanwhile, um, the party, uh, before that, the party went into Naraka um, posing as um, dragon officers with prisoners uh, and being caught lying. Because what, Karaman and, and Tannis were supposed to be the, the dragon officers, and everybody else was the prisoners. And they were like, ah, we're all full up on prisoners, go ahead and just kill them. And they kept trying to push it and, and come up. This is the kind, exact sort of thing that, that felt like a gaming group to me, right? They, they had a plan. It wasn't a horrible plan. It's a bit of a cliche plan, but it's not a horrible plan. Um, but the, the, the situation is such that the plan really never had that great of a chance of success. Um, but you had to sort of, they had to sort of play it by ear and, and think on their feet, which is also feels true to a, a D&D game. Um, so yeah, and the switch in the switch in that where it was no, not really working is because apparently in Naraka, it's the Dragon High Lords convention as all the Dragon High Lords were coming right. in <laughs> to have a big huge meeting with the, the Queen of Darkness right. before their final. Act. So yeah, yeah. So so they get cap- they get caught, um, but Kitiara shows up because, as you said, the Dragon High Lords are all coming to town. Um, Kitty R shows up and is like, oh no, he's totally with me and plays along because she wants to manipulate things or whatever. Um, and, and basically takes Tannis and the others get all sent to the dungeon. Um, cause nobody wants to piss off Kitty R. She's arguably what at this point, second in command in the dragon armies after Ariakis. Yeah. Uh, who has named himself emperor, the dragon emperor. Um. Yeah. So so, and and she makes a deal with Tannis. Like, hey, I'll let you have Lorana. I know that's why you came. I know that's all that's important to you. I'll let you have her. Uh, but you have to be with me. You have to come and work for me. You have to serve uh, Takasis. Right. Um. That's that's going to be the rest of your life. And he, you know, fine. That's if that's what it takes, then that's what I'll do. Um, and, and that is going more or less as planned. Meanwhile, down in the dungeons, uh, Barum, Karaman, um, um, Tannis, and Tika, um, manage to escape when Barum goes crazy and starts killing people because he's being called by his sister down to the column where we know it's going to happen. And so he, Barum and Karaman go down to the column Whereas Tika and Tana, Taz try to escape, um, and you, we are reminded of the visions they had from the Dragon Orb. Was that in Book Two? I think it book was. Yeah. Two, yes. The start of Book Two, the dream with the uh, Cyan Bloodbane, which Bloodbane. is a dragon who shows up every now and then. He shows up twice in this book. There's one where he just like makes an appearance, and, and he was he was a naughty dragon and got locked up, uh, you know, in the in the dragon dungeons or whatever, being punished um, for for pissing off Takasis or whatever. Um, and then it turned out that 
by the end, it turns out that that you know maybe there was a good reason for that, and he ends up teaming up with with Raceland, um instead of Takasus. Uh, so yeah, so those those bunch are, are doing their things down in the dungeon. Tanis is being basically sworn in in front of of Takasus, who manifests in herself, and he has to go and lay his sword at the feet of um, Ariakas and swear his fealty to to Takasus, and and um, he starts second guessing maybe you know either way maybe i'm gonna die maybe this is gonna go hor- horribly for me that uh, uh kidiara just promised lorana to takasis anyway so i'm not gonna get what i want out of this maybe instead of swearing fealty to takasis i should just run ariakas through uh and finish him uh and at least do a little damage to the dragon armies before before i'm killed uh, and then a shadowy figure sort of appears to him and tells him to do it. Says that I will, I will take care of, of Ariakas' magical protections. You cut him down. You finish him. And, and we come to realize that this is the return of Raceland, now wearing the black robes. Um, and so he does. He, he kills Ariakas. The crown falls to the ground. He, he goes for it. Soth goes for it. Um, he has to promise to give it to Kitiara. He uses it as, like, I'll give it to Kitiara, but you have to let me take Lorana from here. And Lorana's like, I don't need your help, dude. I got this. And, <laughs> and, and kind of pushes Tannis away and does her own thing, right? Um, yeah. Then Barum dies. Oh, I'm just ahead. imagining... Just imagining more yeah, right. <laughs> Yes. Uh, and then Barum dies, and the entire temple starts to fall apart as as Takasis is barred from this world, uh, presumably for all time. Well, because a a big part of that is that whoever owns the crown or holds the crown right. is the leader. So the crown becomes really important. That's why Kitiara wants it now that she can have, potentially have it, uh, and why Tannis doesn't want to hold on to it because every, he's just going to have a target on his back right. the whole entire time. Which... And so some people are... So you're no, saying, no, no, go. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, some people were fleeing because they, they don't even want to touch it and other people were like, right. I want that thing. Yeah, which which if you're ever setting up a, a government, um, owning a piece of property is a really, really stupid way to set up your government. Like, it shouldn't matter who physically possesses this physical object of the crown. That's a dumb reason to, to make somebody in charge of your entire country, your entire empire, um, especially when they have dramatically different ideals than, than your people, right? Like, Tannis is a good guy, but he's like, but if I get the crown, I can order them all around and they'll have to follow me. Like, that seems stupid. You should just run him through and take the crown. <laughs> but here we are. Um, so, yeah. So, so Tannis works his way out. Meets up with Lorana. They have their moment. Um, Kitiara, at the last moment, saves him. Right? She she was going to. She shows up with her sword drawn, and, and it has both draconian and human blood on it. And there's this whole moment, and you think she's a threat, and she's the big bad boss fight at the end of the adventure, right? And then she tells them, like, go down into the dungeons. There's a secret passage out here that you can use to get away. Um. And, and they do, and that's where they meet up with and save uh, Tika and Taz, who had been poisoned slash beaten up by Draconians, um, as well as finding Karaman, and they work their way out, and the Dragon Empire is, is in shambles and leaderless, uh, more or less. Uh, I guess Kitiara's got the crown now, presumably. Um, well, uh, Karaman was... Saved. Oh, that's right. In the meantime, yeah, that's right. Because uh, that's right. Raceland was also like the final guardian to getting to the column where where Barum died, uh, and so by conf- by Karaman confronting Raceland, Barum was freed from from Raceland's grasp, and that's how he was able to get to the the column and and do his thing. That's right. Uh, but ultimately, at the end, the the Dragon Empire falls apart, more or less. Um, everything is in ruins. Kitiara has her plan to go and take one of the flying citadels and, and reestablish herself. Um, but I guess yeah, I got to find out what happens with that later. Um, 
Karaman and Tika want to go back to Solace and 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 re you know and live life there and and Taz finds out from Fizbin that he's got more adventures to go on, but Taz doesn't seem to care about that. Um, and and Tannis is going to dedicate his life to trying to I don't know prove to Loriana that he's worthwhile again. Is that more? Did I miss anything? It's, we, that's a lot. Sixteen hours. <laughs> well, uh, uh, Cyan Bloodblade gives a lift to uh, Raceland, and he enters at the end the yeah, Tower that's right. of High Sorcery, and he goes into the Tower of High Sorcery. He takes the black robe that's been fluttering on the the gate there for you know a yeah. hundred years or whatever. He takes that robe off the the gate uh, and declares himself the master of past and present, and that he should be allowed to enter. And I think that's where the second trilogy sort of picks up with him. I didn't even, yeah. I didn't even like. I recognize that tower. I recognize the importance of that tower. I know who's in that tower, but I had forgotten that that didn't make an appearance in this story at all. <laughs> I thought it was going to pop up at some point. So. So yeah, that's that's the story more or less, right? And normally we would go through and talk about like how might this be of interest to the D and D crowd, but I think it's pretty self evident since it was written as a D and D adventure and novel at the same time and how it functions. Um, that there's a lot there that's very D and D ish, right? We have we had what two character two major characters from the beginning of the story die before the end of the story because we've lost Storm and we lost Flint. That was part of the original party. Yeah. Yeah. But everybody else kind of makes it out, don't they? Much lower. Yeah, much lower death count than Game of <laughs> well, Thrones. That's not a that's that's a, a whole different bar to reach, right? <laughs> <laughs> if if that's the comparison, is is there many many stories that where they're even comparable to the main character death count uh, than Game of Thrones? Or the Song of Ice and Fire, I guess, is this is the series. I, yeah. What did I find interesting about the Dragonlance is that, in the end, it's not really the heroes that go and beats up the evil. It's the evil that beats up mm-hmm. among themselves and start fighting among themselves mm-hmm. and destroying themselves, which was different than other. Yeah. We've read. Well, it's like it's like it's like I it's like I mentioned. Like you, you see Kitiara in that moment, and you think, okay, here's the big boss fight. Because in my mind, from the beginning, Tannis is kind of the main character of the story, right? Like clearly, at other times he's not, but he's sort of set up in, in the beginning as your your point of view character in chapter one or whatever. Yeah. And so, as soon as as soon as I read chapter one of a story, whoever the point of view character is in chapter one, kind of in my mind, becomes the main character. Uh, and, and so Tannis yeah. is kind of the main main character, and then Kitty Yara shows up, and she's the main villain, and so this is going to be the big boss fight, and then it's not. But but the good guys, the heroes, have behaved in such a way; they've done the things necessary to basically like evil empires work so long as there is a a power strong enough to scare everybody into in, into line, right? But with the death of Ariakas yeah. and the, the sealing away of Takasis, there is no, nothing left strong enough to hold evil together, and it, it falls on, in on itself. Yeah. yeah. One thing that I'm there's a slight disappointment is that the, the big flying fortresses, they're mentioned, they show up briefly, but you don't really yeah. see them. It's, yeah. They're living... I wonder. I wonder if there is anything in any of the in the other novels that. Deal and it seems like I mean, but. they describe it as like somebody magically ripped an entire castle out of the the ground, and now it flies around. And I'm like, that seems like a huge feat of magic. And magic in the dragon armies does not seem to be like they don't seem to have super powerful magic users, <laughs> you know. Uh, so that is a little weird that like. They had the magic necessary to tear these things out, tear castles out of the ground, and fly around the continent. Where are those mages? 
And why aren't they, like, throwing fireballs and lightning bolts all, all over the place in the middle of, of a battle, you know? And another thing I found in the, in the, the series is that it starts out with there's no gods, and then six months later there's, like, seems to be an overabundance of gods and clerics and just talking about it and fully accepting them rather than it being... Oh, it's new. Well, there's, yeah, th- th- I mean, by the end, they're not talking about the gods being new anymore. You don't... Are, are there clerics yeah. in the third book at all? I don't remember any clerics in the third book. I mean, Gold Moon uh, leaves yeah. pretty quick. Well, I know that... It, well, there was... At least, you know, in the evil army, there was talk about I suppose. clerics. Uh, which... Uh, they're, since they're, they probably knew about the, the gods right. beforehand because they were building up our oh, so that makes sense. But uh, uh, where do I remember? I, I, I feel like I feel like you know, book one is the gods were gone, but they have returned. Book two is, and yeah. now we get to see the the beginning, the 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 seeds being planted of of priesthoods growing again. And book three is, yeah. let's ignore the fact that priesthoods are growing again because now the gods are on stage. Like, you see Paladine. Yeah. You see yeah. Tachesis. Uh, you don't yeah. see, like, um, Reorix or, or any of the others, but you like you meet uh, Astinus, who, who is not a god, but, like, is an immortal who, who serves the gods, right? Uh, so the immortals, the celestials take the stage and the clerics kind of become non-issues other than the evil ones so it's interesting and, and you're not wrong like if you track the whole story I think yeah I mean it's it's like what six to nine months total from beginning of the story to the yeah. end well, it's, it's three right. seasons. so it's a it's a it's a huge like, a lot happens real fast with the gods. Like, when they come back, they kind of flooded back real quick. Uh, they gone, They went from nobody believes the gods exist to, oh, look, there's one over there in, like, six months. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be a dramatic change, uh, I imagine, in the world. So. It would be. It would be a big change. All right. Any, any last thoughts? All right. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed um, going through this again, warts and all. Um, I enjoyed going back and being able to get, actually get the story that I clearly didn't remember at all from my youth um, and, and consume it with a more mature perspective um, to the point that now I, I want to go through and read the Legends books as well. And see if my memories on those those sort of stand up. But um, as as I mentioned before we started recording, I only have two credits left on Audible, and I don't. That's not enough to pick up the series. And we still have more books to read uh, this year for the book club. So um, I'm gonna probably hang on to those and maybe maybe uh, hope to read those again later someday. So what I'm hearing is I'm at least safe through the end of this year. Well, yeah, well, right. I mean, we had talked about at one point, we had talked about going through the rest of this series in the same way we did um, um, the Magnus Chase series. Uh, and Tracy was not super eager to, to be inundated with that much Dragonlance all at one time, uh, which is fair. Um, but yeah, so. In, in, in a way, both series are. Itself, like the Dragonlance Chronicles, is its own series. The Dragonlance Legend is its own series. Yes, there were connections, but in- well, and again, I, I I think because in my mind the only story that mattered was Raceland, um, in which case they're not two series. If you're if you're following Raceland's story primarily, it's one series of six books, you know. So, um, but yeah, so I'll be I'll be curious to to get back into that someday, whether it's for the book club or just on my own. Um, so. All right. Well, let's go ahead and call that the end of our episode. So it is time to say goodbye. We want to say thanks to our sponsor, Galdra's Gazetteer, uh, for supporting us for a few months. And for all of our patrons at patreon.com slash the Tome Show uh, and anyone who otherwise supports the the community uh, that we have. 
And if you'd like to contact us, you can email us at the tome show at gmail.com. You can use our biz line, 919 Kids Tome. Do we still have I that, Jeff? Know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you can uh, find me at Sarah Dark Magic on Twitter. That's Sarah with an H and SarahDarkMagic.com. You can find Jeff on Twitter at Squatch, S-Q-U-A-C-H. You can find Eric at Eric M. Pack, E-R-I-C-M-P-A-Q. The show is at The Tome Show. And you can find us on Facebook, Patreon, and Discord. We are pretty lively on Discord these days. Every, uh, every now and then, uh, it comes and goes, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes yeah. we're, it, it is, the conversation is going a mile a minute, and sometimes it's not. It's actually, one of the things I really appreciate our Discord is that we're not so big that it's just constant inundation of, of me getting lost in things, right? We can have good, meaningful conversations um, uh, and really talk about a lot of things really well and, and get good participation, but it's not just a nonstop barrage of conversation that I get lost in. Um, And they can watch us live as we record the episode on twitch.tv slash Tome Show, or watch the video after the fact on the Tome Show's YouTube channel. Show notes and other great shows are at, are at thetomeshow.com. So that is our thoughts on Dragons of Spring Dawning. Next up in August uh, of 2021, we will be reading Children of Virtue and Vengeance by Tony Tomi Ariyami. Uh, until then, keep turning the page, Tomites. And that is where our recording stops. This was a long one, and I talked way too much. <laughs> I just didn't have much else to say other than woo women. Yeah. <laughs> That's fair. Oh, yes. I, I know, in, like, in Legends, uh, a lawful good cleric of, of paladin she's the one that falls in love with raceland so an evil wizard and then a good cleric right and that's i did, the, i had forgotten that she was uh, a lawful good cleric i just remembered that her i just remembered her name and there was some yeah. iconic art that they did a lot of art uh back in the day with Dragonlance, and there was some iconic art of her down by the pool where she where the the incident went down where she was raped so Anyway, we should say goodbye to the stream. Adios, folks.